yeah. wait, you put that on a pocket yeah. or somewhere. Because the technician said, this is way better. Okay. You're gonna be walking around. And you forget about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. I think so. Then we have a bit of margin. Then you give a couple of minutes extra. Combined morphological and uh, molecular data sets to phylogenetically place fossil redo idea. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Swapno. And I'm presenting this talk on behalf of my fossil expert called. Too much, maybe? Is that better? Okay. Uh, my fossil expert colleagues, Ernst Heiss, uh, Sonja Wiedmann, and two bioinformatics wizard postdocs, past and present in my lab, Paul Mazonek and Alexander Gnishov. And I'm not really going to be boring you with telling you how magnificent Vedovidi are, because at least some of us in the room actually agree on that, if not maybe all of us. But I do want to remind you that there's about 6,900 described extant species of Vedovidi, and this is in fairly stark contrast to the number of described fossil species, which is only 35 of them, mostly described from the Eocene, Oligocene, and Miocene, and actually really only one very recently described species, uh, Paleotriatoma tri um, meta metaxitaxa, over here on the left, from Cretaceous Ember. And I'm listing down here below the sort of taxonomic uh, distribution of these fossils. And as you can tell, Emma Science have done a particularly good job in being fossilized, in particular in amber. So one example up here, that's Denorumphus uh, mixtus, which is a really nicely pr preserved M sign fossil, and then you see other, you know, typically bark associated species like holoptolines, for example, centroclamidines, as you would expect. And then the subfamilial placement of other taxa is actually uncertain, which is unfortunate. But if you look at some of these compression fossils, you're amazed that people would even classify them as Vediviri because they frankly don't look very great. And um, even, I want to say, recently described species, such uh, as this one from Green River. Oops, sorry, wasn't meant to happen. This one that was very recently, last year, described from the Green River Formation they are not or have not been included in phylogenetic analysis to actually really phylogenetically place them to then inform the classification. But having said that, uh, people have, of course, in true bugs and also in Vediviet specifically, used and integrated fossils into analyses. And this typically has been done in terms of building big molecular phylogenies and then using fossil species as calibration points to divergent state these trees. And these analyses show us, for example, um, you know, showing you the Johnson et al. Um, study as an example that the divergence of Heteroptera from Ocanorinca and Coleoptera happened about maybe 350 million years ago. The split between Zimachromorpha and Pentatomomorpha about 250 million years ago. And then closer to home, Vedivioids may have diverged from the remaining Zimachromorpha a whopping 225 million years ago, so a very, very long time ago, way before we have any fossils, really, uh, to look at. And then similarly, we have done studies on Vedivides, even though the study now is really quite outdated, because since then, we've realized that one of the fossils was really horribly misplaced in this tree and should go actually somewhere completely different. Uh, we showed that the phymatine complex in the higher Vedivides diverged about 100 million years ago, so right around uh, when you find Cretaceous, uh, no, phymatine complex and higher Vedivides diverged about 106 million years ago, um, so right around um, way before actually we have Cretaceous ember fossils. The diversification among higher Vedivides, which really contained a great majority of species in the bugs, started a little bit after um, Cretaceous ember. 
And then Halpak Khomeini, and I'm specifically mentioning the subfamily because it will be important for the rest of my talk, depending on different analyses, we think diverged between 50 and 70 million years ago from its sister group. And I'm sort of pointing these out, even though most studies will claim that they place their fossils based on PARMS criteria, meaning you use synapomorphy-based criteria to figure out which node your fossil should calibrate, they are not actually included in these analyses. So we do not really know for certain where they are placed in these phylogenies, which of course isn't really great. So there's alternatives to that, and what I'm showing here is one of them. So you could do just a morphological data set, of course, and many analyses have done that, using morphological data, parsimony reconstruction typically, and then you can include your fossils into these data sets and then phylogenetically place them. And even though this is a really common practice across insects, when you look at true bugs in general, there aren't really actually that many studies that have done exactly that, which is a little bit surprising. And then furthermore, the problem with these morphology-only analyses, as I want to call them, is they're often not very well uh, uh, resolved, as well as not as well supported as they could be. And we also know that they're sometimes in conflict with combined morphological and monocular analyses. So they're a step forward, but maybe not really all we should be doing. So moving on to what about combining morphological and molecular data to then include morphological data sets for the fossil species and then place them in what is called a total evidence approach. And you could do that doing any of the analyt analytical methods people are using, either parsimony, maximum likelihood, or Bayesian approaches. So clearly the pros of these approaches would be there's a much better result in supported trees typically. You could also argue that there's cons, which is that if you use likelihood or Bayesian approaches, there could be model misspecifications for the morphological partition, although some recent studies have shown that they may actually not really be affecting analyses in a really de detrimental way, I want to say. And then further cons, of course, are that for many groups of true bugs, we're still missing robust molecular phylogenies as well. But I want to argue we are, of course, actually getting better. So when I searched for studies on Hemiptera that actually have used a combined morphological molecular data set to place and integrate fossils, I found only one single study, and that is actually on coccoids, that study by Villa and Grimaldi published in 2016. And I decided this is not good. We're more modern than that in true bugs, and we should be actually trying to change that. So enter the two fossils that I'm focusing on for this talk. And I'm referring to the one on the left as the mesyl pit, or just a mesyl fossil. And this is what it looks like. Um, a little difficult to see, and this is not only the slide, but it's the kind of fossil that you keep staring at, try to figure things out, and it's just a lot of hard work, to put it that way. Um, after a lot of staring, we decided, yes, it's a very weird, that's not a question, and we think it's probably a halpacterine. And the second fossil, much easier to deal with in many ways, just because it's Burmese amber, but also in many ways a lot more weird, because it's very old, as the one on the right, uh, where we're pretty convinced it's a simicomorph, and we think possibly a radiovioid, but we weren't really quite certain on that either. So we decided to use these two as test cases, essentially, to figure out can we do these combined approaches to more confidently place these fossils. And in order to do so, what we did is examine, document, and code the morphology. In the case of the possibly Halpacterine fossil, we created a new morphological matrix, which is WIP, meaning work in progress, so we're not quite there yet. This is all very preliminary data I'm showing here based on 48 characters, and the emphasis is really on externally visible characters that could be coded ideally on a fossil. At this point, 32 of these 48s are actually coded for the fossil. And for the second data set, we recycled the morphological matrix of 20, uh, 81 characters that we published in 2019, and 47 of these 81 characters were coded for the fossil. Then to the molecular data set, for the Halpacterines, we used a 250 taxon data set 
uh, combining ribosomal data for all taxa with HE anchotype enrichment, big loci uh, data sets for two, uh, 42 taxa. And uh, a lot of the ribosomal data was already generated for a bunch of different analyses that we've published over the years. And so a fairly robust, I want to say, overall um, analysis. And then the second data set is a little bit more, you know, kind of modest, um, only 4 KB of ribosomal data. So the 2019 data set plus included a bunch more of the early diverging lineages of Vediviates as well as more pachynomids as well. And then we analyzed those using likelihood as well as parsimony data, uh, in particular parsimony implied weights. And one of the very pleasing things for me at least was that the likelihood and the parsimony analyses came up with exactly the same topology, which I totally didn't expect, but I was very, very pleased to see that things are working out in a way that you think, you know, a bit of congruence between these two approaches gives you more confidence uh, into your tree. And then finally, we did ancestral uh, character state reconstruction, the case of the likelihood analyses, or just uh, character optimization of morphological characters for the person in the analyses uh, to better understand why our fossil ended up where it did end up. Okay, starting with the first fossil, Hapactriani uh, sensolatu, I'm not actually going to be going uh, through the uh, tribes in any detail, just important to know when I talk about Hapactriani sensolatu, that's a total of two subfamilies closely related, one venering the other paraphyletic, seven tribes, and the larger one, the Halpacturini, more than 2,500 species. So that's a big chunk of Radiviat um, diversity. And then we've done quite a bit of molecular phylogenetic work on a group, but really not much in terms of morphology. And just to remind you again, we talked about the divergence of that group from its relatives around 50 to 70 million years ago. But quite um, cool morphological diversity. So this is what a fossil looks like, the mesopit fossil, Eocene, 47 billion years ago. We were really lucky to have a lot of specimens, 19 in total, representing the same species. This is really very unusual, of course, for fossils. They come in various orientations, different details are visible in different specimens, but nevertheless, the interpretation of morphology is really challenging. I'm just telling people, I sort of have a hate-love relationship to these fossils because they're challenging, but you know, finding the right you know, character really that you can easily document is really, has been really, really difficult. Okay, so running these combined analyses, this is what we get. Uh, non halpactrine vetiviates are shown in gray on the right. Uh, we have the upper water rind clay, the sister group to the halpactrine. We have halpactrine, of course, monophyletic uh, with dicotylines, actinodorines, bactrodines, uh, and epiomorines forming a clade and the sister group to what we call the higher halpactrine, here indicated by the blue star. And then you have in the higher Halpactorini all the remaining Halpactorines, Diospidiines, Vaphidosomines, and so on and so forth. And the fossil goes right here. So zooming in on this a little bit, what we see is the fossil is deeply nested among old world taxa within the higher Halpactorini, which of course is somewhat pleasing because it is from the old world. And we recovered it as sister taxon to the Diospidiines, which are odd looking. African so-called resin bugs. So they're really unusual among the higher Halpactorini. And based on the analyses we did a few years ago, the diversification of higher Halpactorini started about 40 million years. So now that we know that uh, this fossil, assuming the placement is correct, is somewhere close to the base of this higher Halpactorini, it would actually push that back by about 10 million years. So this is still something under investigation but our current hypothesis. So how did that fossil end up there? Well, um, Halpactriani and our analyses are supported, among other features, by having the antennae slide the incrusate, and this is something that is sort of visible. I want to say in a fossil, here's another Halpactriani for a comparison in an outgroup ready behind. Uh, we can also, I think at least, I can see the basal process on the claw that in this decrotaline SEM photo is really, really clear a lot more difficult to see and maybe involving some imagination. You can see it on that mesofossil. I know, that's what I feel too. 
And then when it comes to higher Halpacterini, we're getting into characters that have not actually really been used for Halpacterine phylogenetics, but I think have somewhat potential. So higher Halpacterines tend to have these really fusiform elliptical combination of the two membrane cells versus in outgroup um, Bediviates, there are kind of two sort of clearly separated cells. And again, you can't see it because it's too dark. You can see it somewhat on those projectors over here. Uh, we do see that similar um, kind of outline in that fossil as well. Somewhat making me feel a little bit more confident that it actually could be a higher hopacterine. And then finally, the close relationship with the uh, diospedine is supported by the antennophore being adjacent to the eye. This is the antennophore. The eye is right here. Having a labium that's both straight and stout that is visible in this particular specimen that's oriented such that you can actually see the ventral surface. We have a four tibia, sorry. We have a four tibia that's slightly curved that's also found in DSPDINs. And then we have a four tarsus that is very short and or reduced, which is unusual for higher hypocterines, as well as a two-segmented mid tarsus, which is also really unusual. Okay, so in summary, we are a little bit more confident, I want to say, that this fossil is a hypocterine, probably a higher hypocterine, and potentially it could be close to DSPDINs, but there's still a lot of work to do to be certain. Okay, uh, just much more quickly, a few more words on the um, Burmese amber fossil, which just looks simply really quite cool. So it's a really little guy, about five millimeters long, ovoid body shape, and it has this really striking bestature on the legs and the pronotum that superficially um, sort of makes it look a little bit like a sitnet, hence our manuscript name at a new, uh, moment, Cydubius. Uh, which is what we will hopefully call it. When you look at it more closely, you see it has a lot of really, you know, possibly radioid characters, uh, four-segmented labium, anteriorly oriented on the head, a really large fossil spongiosa, um, as well as wing venation characters, including the chiral commissure that's absent, that makes us fairly confident that it's a semicomorphin and probably a radioid. So what we're trying to figure out with that big phylogeny we did is where does it actually go? Would it fall inside Vediviates, maybe inside Paganomets, or would it come out somewhere else? And this is what we're finding. So it's essentially recovered in a polytomy with Paganomets and Vediviates. So there's not enough characters to push it into either one of these groups, suggesting that it may have to be um, described as um, um, a monotypic family on its own. So the combination of characters that make it a radioid is actually quite long, and I will not go through that because I'm running out of time. Position of the ocelli behind the eyes is one of the more you know, critical and credible and easy to see ones, but there's also other features, especially in the wing venation. It doesn't, it's not a radioid for sure. There's no prosternal stridulitrum. Other features are absent as well, so we can pretty much dismiss that without too much trouble um, as well. And then same for the pachynomidae. There's just not enough evidence to really stick it into pachynomidae because mostly of internal structure as well as wing venation again. So in conclusion, uh, we're now more confident. It's a semicomorphin, it's a radivioid. We think it would render radivioids or pachynomids at least potentially paraphyletic if we included it in either one of the families. And we decided we will describe it as a monotypic family within the radioidea based on the data we have. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators and people who've helped with that project and you for your attention. I guess we can take just one question very fast. Yeah, if anyone has. Yeah, some of us have been working with uh, Burmese amber so far, and we're finding like weird, really weird things going on in terms of we do not know uh, some cases where does that fit at all, and I, I see that you're having the same problem. Because, yeah. um, for example, in the lab we have something similar to a medocostide, but pff, nobody knows what it is. 
Uh, it looks like an Abbey, it looks like a Redouvi, it, it looks like everything but nothing at the same time. But at, secondarily, um, when we have all this information, we are finding ourselves that we cannot publish it right now. All these samples, like, we have the samples, but nobody's accepting these samples because they come from Burmese Amber. And then we are, like, stuck having these super precious samples in terms of phylogenetically speaking. But we cannot do anything with them. Well, it depends on what documentation you have, like for the fossil. So a lot of journals will ask, like, you know, where did you get it? How was it purchased? How was it? You know, which collections? Blah blah blah. If you have that kind of documentation, it's not a problem. But yeah, a lot of journals will say if it was purchased on eBay, you know, not good to touch it. So. Sorry. But then, but then what? Then what do you do with the samples? Throw them away? I don't know. So SysEd is sort of right now on the margin of not quite sure what to do with, so we say as long as the authors can give some kind of a, you know, credible explanation on how they got those specimens, we're okay with it, but um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of black market stuff, obviously, mm -hmm. that's a problem. And very important taxa, as you're pointing out as well. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you, Christiana. Now we are moving. <laughs> now we are moving on the symposium on pentatomoidia, and the first speaker on symposium is Salini Santama, and she will be talking on the topic a systematic account of Halini, Heteroptera, Pentatomidae, Pentatomini, with description of two new species from India. Hello. Am I audible? So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, my I'm dealing with the systematic account of Halini, one of the problematic groups of Pendetomidae, with uh, from India actually, for fauna of India, with the description of two new species. Uh, around 433 species which are uh, reported from world uh, um, under 91 genera of this only 70 species in 18 genera are reported from India. The uh, distribution it is all over globally distributed. Uh, the major uh, uh, problem with uh, this group is the phenotypic plasticity. It uh, shows lots of variation in various external morphological characters. Um, usually it's medium to large sized, elongate, uh, usually flattened body. Head with elongate, with uh, head, head usually elongate, with uh, buccule rounded. This is the typical kind of external scent afferent system or the scent gland. Mm, so uh, the remaining uh, some other characters are lateral margins of head and pronotum, often with the denticles or serrations. Of course, these characters can be we can also find in some other um, uh, taxa of Pentatomidae. Uh, humor a variable. Uh, scutellum subtriangular, base of abdominal, abdominal vendor, unarmed, usually with a spine or tubercle will be there, but in this case there won't be, it, is, it won't be there. And the vendor of the abdomen may or may not be sulcate. So the, uh, the thing is uh, that these uh, various morphological characters, even though we are speaking, um, the, according to Gross, um, uh, it is uh, true that we all reckon we know whether a thing is a halene or not, but we exactly do not know what are the distinguishing characters of this particular group. So the, um, after his um, uh, study on uh, Australian uh, group of halene, he uh, mentioned that the distinguishing characters lie in the structure of male genitalia, especially of the adegas. So in, uh, as far as Indian fauna is concerned, these are mainly uh, bark dwellers. Majority of uh, these um, uh, insects we found, find in uh, bark of trees, um, especially like uh, these are few of the host plants which we find in India that are huge numbers sometimes congregating on the bark of the trees. They will be hiding during the daytime and feeding during the night time. So some bit of the biology is uh, uh, exotypical pentatomid uh, kind with uh, five uh, instars. 
these are the uh, 18 genera um, of uh, here are 10 other uh, uh, eight are here but a uh, few of these uh, things like amaridalpa aseila then jugalpada nevisanus orthoschisops these things we don't have i don't have in my collection so the remaining genera will be little bit briefly dealt um, of these, Halis is the first one of, uh, out of the 14 species, we have only four species from India. The uh, distribution, of course, from uh, several places, Europe, Asia, Africa, uh, Saudi Arabia, Madagascar. So these uh, are the four uh, species, Sergera, Shaista, and Mudigarensis is the one new species which I described, and then Salgata. So this, uh, the mainly I deal with the uh, classical taxonomy, like uh, male genitalia is the major thing which we uh, use to differentiate these particular, ma many of these species in this group. So you can see the differences in the uh, genital capsule and uh, especially of paramere and the gen uh, rim of the genital capsule. Um, so here, uh, if I summarize this one for the four species, you can see the shape of the um, paramir. So probable, uh, I didn't do any morphological, uh, um, I mean phylogeny using morphological characters or anything, but then I, as for my experience, I feel that this is, is a kind of shape of the paramir is uh, uh, probable, probable synapomorphy for uh, differentiating the species of this uh, genus. Uh, for example, here is another genus called Neohalis. Uh, previously, it was included under Halis. Uh, the shape of the parameter, you can clearly make out that. So later on, Ahmad and Parveen, 1982, uh, they proposed the new genus, Neohalis, for accommodating the sericolis. Before, it was Halis sericolis. So um, coming to the next genus, uh, Earthsina, here we have around um, six species, uh, I mean five species are reported, the, the Arthisina pakistansis is newly uh, recorded. Based on the parameters, we could, uh, we have collection only three species. Um, so here the mesa, uh, anterior mesial lobe of the parameter and the spine of the parameter that the angle which, with, with which it is making and also the shape of the anterior mesial lobe of the parameter. Also the pygophore, the uh, middle, median process in the dorsal side of the pygophore, you can make out the clear cut uh, uh, variation. So based on this, uh, we got three species. This is a monotypic genus, Eupileopoda. Um, so when uh, it, uh, it, was, uh, it is found that Dalpada McDonaldi is Az Azim and Shafi uh, described one species called uh, Dal Dalpada McDonaldi, but uh, we can make out clearly that it is uh, nothing but Eupileopoda consino, so it is synonymized with that. Merid India is, uh, the majority of these species, uh, gen uh, genera are restricted to Asia, especially India and Pakistan, majority of these things are uh, not reported from any other part of the parts of the world, um, except in India or neighboring countries, majority of them. So Merid India is also, it is restricted to India, um, probably some to Sri Lanka also. So these are the four species. So here uh, the Salmana, uh, Meridindia Salmana and Meridindia Farata. The shape of the paramir, you can clearly make out these all having a kind of, um, oh, kind of a C, C shape or something, whatever it may be, the, that shape. And here actually the Kanija is another one I, we didn't have in our collection, but this is from Gauri's paper. So based on this, these all, uh, go to one uh, genus. Here the new species that is Arjuni, which is, um, which we are getting commonly, we are getting this species there, but the parameter is slightly different. Uh, though, uh, since there is not much evidence, um, after, uh, at the end I will be dealing with the molecular phylogeny, prelimi preliminary one, so in that also we can make out. So this is clubbing with uh, Merid India, so I, uh, time being I put it in this one. So this is the various structures of, uh, uh, this particular species, phallus, and um, here uh, these species are very much related with uh, uh, this new species, very much related to Salmana. So you can make out that uh, difference um, of the, this is the close up of the male genitalia. Uh, even the head, there is a two pairs of uh, uh, tooth on in front of uh, uh, compound eyes and uh, another in front of uh, in the apex of the, towards apex. So sometimes 
It, um, I mean, it is absent, but I don't know whether probably as far as Helene is concerned, probably this may be a variable character, but as, at least in the case of male and female genitalia, there is shape in the valvifers, shape, difference in the shape of valvifers of uh, female of Meridindia arginia as well as Salmana. So Tipulpara is, uh, there are several species which are reported from India of this, um, the one which I uh, deal with is pseudoversicolar. Um, the major synapomorphies which I feel is the uh, shape of the posterior lateral angles of the pygophore as well as the um, uh, elongate adegus and the shape of the paramir. Uh, this is a, um, some of the genera um, actually we have to hold, holistically study like for example Kahara and another one gen gen genus uh, Sarju which I am dealing in the next coming slides. So this has to be combinedly studied in fact. Uh, even though there are several species reported, first uh, 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 if uh, Sarju and these uh, two genera how they have differentiated mainly because of the uh, median lobes in the uh, genital capsule. So uh, the absence of that one will go to Sarju and uh, there is also a CETOS process in the uh, paramir uh, but this is a little bit variable but that is what we could find um, from uh, why I included this, these line drawings are from Gauri's uh, uh, literature. The thing is Gauri's uh, diagrams are not completely matching with the one which we are getting there is slight differences so I just put it as near to that species here also the same case the CETOS process and uh, the um, which is absent but um, I mean which is present in Kahara but it is absent in case of Sarju this is the one which I am telling here you can make out the difference of the um, the median process there is a bilobed median process in case of Kahara but it is absent in case of Sarju but uh, and also of course there is a Sarju is actually uh, they also told one more character is the second antenna segment is geniculate. But of course these um, really when we examine the various species under these both genera it is quite variable. Probably these two genera has to be synonymized. So these are the various species. So come to uh, uh, another this is another interesting genus that is Meridalpa. Here while describing, originally while describing itself, Gauri has told that uh, they, he is combining two related, uh, seems to be too close, I mean two, two unrelated uh, species. It looks like, see the both the things we have here, Meridalpa toriformis as well as, sorry, Meridalpa, uh, Meridalpa pilicornis. Both are uh, entirely different, probably they may go to different um, uh, gen uh, genera itself. But uh, see, uh, we also don't have that many number of specimens. Probably we may have to collect more number of specimens to get more evidence for this. And uh, another, this is a problematic genus, in fact, in Helene. This, um, uh, in fact, from this genus only, several of the um, genera has uh, proposed uh, by various workers, like especially Gauri. So this is still under um, like uh, the one which I just now synon uh, told the synonymization like that several things may go to different uh, uh, genus. Um, for example, here also in uh, Dalpada neoclavata, this is a lectotype, I think uh, David Ryder has designated this. This, uh, uh, unfortunately, we got only female. Uh, this is from Natural History Museum, Denmark. Uh, we are, th this is uh, in fact, um, it is uh, first uh, described from the southern part of India. We are getting commonly, uh, commonly we are getting one species, uh, same like Neoclaveta, but then of course there is, uh, mm, the interesting thing is the paramere is very different um, and there is a difference in kind of, I mean, of course, Neoclaveta type, we do not know the, um, since we don't have male, we do not know, but then, of course, there is a difference in the head shape, but the pronotum is similar, it all, overall look is very similar, and also there is one more species which is uh, occurring in the northeastern side, uh, from Arunachal Pradesh, that is, um, I am proposing as a new species, time being, putting in, it in uh, Dalpada itself, unfortunately, we did not get any DNA material for this. Uh, so this also is entirely different but probably once we get the DNA of this probably we may get more conclusion that whether it actually belongs to DNA, um, Dalpada or some um, something else. 
So these are the paramere and phallus of that particular species. It's generally different. So the typical dalpada actually is having a um, um, very uh, concave margin for the ventral, um, um, ventral as well as the dorsal margin of the pygophore is having typically very um, deep uh, concave margin and also the paramere shape. Um, another thing is the dala, dala pada, I mean dalpada, dala means is kind of uh, leaf and uh, pada is foot uh, in Sanskrit. So based on uh, that, this dalapada, dalpada is erected, but then uh, of course there are several species which are not having this anterior tibia dilated. Another one is apodifus and uh, the similar, another closely related genus is paranevisanus. Both of these, uh, this is uh, this distributed uh, through Europe as well as Asia, but the um, other one paranevisanus which is only in, uh, restricted to Asian region, here also the shape of the genital capsule and also the paramural shape is the uh, possible synapomorphies for this particular, you can see the, the caudal angles is very spinose kind, uh, but it is very um, kind of a round structure in this uh, um, apodifus. So, probable synapomorphies can be that one. Then Lotus of course is the monotype, it was a monotypic genus and uh, recently I described one more species, um, Lotus of course Sante from uh, Arunachal Pradesh. So here the, um, there is a stout finger like process laterally in the infoldings of ventral rim of the pygophore. You can see here, ventral rim of the pygophore there is a hook like uh, process and also the particular beak like uh, structure of the paramere is very, um, I mean it's a probably a pro possible synapomorphy for this particular genus. Both the species there it is having this particular characters. So uh, based on all these species, um, actually uh, I could uh, generate a barcode for around 10 uh, species um, and the remaining uh, around 10, 13 species I could uh, pull out the uh, DNA from the gene bank and then combinedly we did a preliminary phylogeny analysis, phylogenetic analysis. Um, I know may not be much, uh, we cannot derive much of the, uh, uh, what is that, uh, evidences from this, but then of course uh, few of the like Halley's and uh, Brokimina, Neo Halley's, Ertsina, they are coming as a um, cladding together, but then I mean they are separate clades, but in case of Dalpada it is uh, of course as we discussed before, like Dalpada Neoclaveta is uh, stands out. So it needs to be, uh, I think, further DNA, uh, further species, probably some of the species may be missing in this. Um, so once it comes, we may get more conclusive results. So the, uh, I conclude my talk like uh, the species determination using external morphology or coloration in case of Halene is a crime, in fact, because uh, lots of uh, similarity, you, this, they look very similar externally. And male genitalia characterization plays a major role in species determination. Uh, of course, um, studying of the types, um, especially the male genitalia, along with the morphological characterization, um, I mean molecular characterization, both should go hand in hand. Then a holistic study of the related genera like Sarju, Kahara, like that, some of the groups has to be holistically studied using both morphological and molecular characterization. Then only we probably we can delineate some of the taxa. Uh, especially in case of um, even the generic level delimitation is not that, uh, I mean it has not come to a, in a good shape in case of Haleni, uh, probably in many tribes of Pendatomidae. Thank you. This, uh, this is my acknowledgement actually. Sorry. Any questions? Then now I call upon our next speaker, Alex Ramsey. Uh, Alex will be presenting on the topic, they are all painted black towards a new Europe-wide key for Sydney with notes on taxonomy and ecology.
afternoon. Uh, so uh, I suppose the first misconception about Sydneyds is that most of them are black. Well, here we are. We can just see quite clearly that these are Sydneyds and they are not black. Uh, so basically this is towards a new key, and I say the key being towards, it's kind of study towards a new key developed for Europe as a whole, uh, because unfortunately uh, most of the keys are now outdated. The current situation with uh, species in Europe is there are around now 64 species known, of which about five are essentially very recent uh, either imports or they've actually colonized Europe independently. Uh, so this just gives a, a flavor, if you like, of the uh, whole group in Europe. Most of the groups are within two subfamilies, Sydneyne and the Saharine. Uh, and essentially, the, the easy way to distinguish the species are the hairy heads and the non-hairy heads, if you like. The Saharine, no hairs on the heads or CT at all on the heads. All the other groups with very varying uh, pegs and CT on the head. And as a field character, fairly, well, can be quite useful. Unfortunately, at the higher levels, there's still a lack of consensus on the, the species groups as a whole. Um, Thyria corridae are unfortunately jumped in and out and in and out of the Sydneydae. Uh, so hopefully at some point there will be some consensus on that as whether it's going to be included or not. Uh, but at the moment, uh, current classification suggests it should be regarded as a subfamily, whereas other recent classifications have suggested that it should be just a separate family. For the purpose of this talk, um, it's going to be following the kind of older classifications in terms of regarding um, Thyroicordia as a separate family. And unfortunately, that doesn't stop there. Uh, the higher, the lower level classifications at generic level is equally confusing. And a lot of species have jumped from one genera to another, even within recent decades. Uh, so, I mean, essentially, Saharis to Canthophorus to Adamaris is um, less than a decade uh, for one or one or two species. Um, and a lot of species are very changeable in their names. They've been lumped, split raised from subfamily, so it's very useful to just get a handle on understanding who named them initially because that will help to understand the genera as a whole. So starting with the fun ones, uh, these are unfortunately some of the rarest species in Europe as well. Uh, two of this family within the Cephaloctiniae. Uh, we only have two representatives in Europe, they're more widespread in other parts of the world. Uh, but the, this one is Stiberopus henke, which is now unfortunately restricted to the uh, Black Sea coast of both Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, the um, one on the left is the uh, adult, um, and the one on the right is the nymph. Um, and essentially that's about half a meter under a marrow grass tussock to get to these species. Uh, so at the bottom there is a photo showing uh, their specific habitat and it's literally right next to the beach. The other one is a bit more widespread but very, very scattered throughout the Mediterranean um, and predominantly occurs mostly in western Mediterranean dunes, also found in North Africa. Um, but essentially it's a much more sporadically found species. And unfortunately, that may be due to the fact that the uh, stitchel, which is one of the main guides to shield bugs um, at, in the 1960s, um, is insistent on that it's found only under Centauria uh, macrocephala, which is a Caucasus endemic species. Uh, it's very likely, given its habitat, which is sand dunes and so on, and sandy areas, that it will also be a species uh, associated with uh, sand dune grasses, such as Amophila and probably should be better looked for under those plants. It's very distinct from uh, Stiberopus because the, uh, the grooves that you can see in the Stiberopus uh, on the scutellum are completely absent in Cephaloctius. So it's very, very, uh, essentially a very uh, smooth and shiny species. Moving on to the uh, 
and I'll have to flick back to remember which ones we're talking about here. Uh, so this is the Sydney we're on now. So I'm going to basically just going very quickly through the, the groups, basically. The Sydney, the largest, the most obvious species, Sydney satyrimus, very easy to identify. Um, you can use head characters, but equally the sinuate um, hind margin of the uh, Hemiolytra is a very useful field character. And also its size will serve to distinguish it from most other species in Europe. Typically, almost always associated be Forbiaceae species, um, either in forests, sandy forests, and pine forests in parts of uh, southern Europe, but more typically in sand dunes. Um, and essentially, grubbing at the bases of large euphorbias is a very easy way to find this species. Ethus um, is one of these problematic genera where it's been swapped around. There used to be many more species in this, ge in this generic group in Europe. Now it only has two. Um, one of which is very rare, not only from Corfu, um, whereas the more common Aethys pelosus is common throughout the Mediterranean and typically in sandy areas. Another rather gnarly group, um, partly because of numerical changes, but partly because they are very, very difficult to identify. And um, quite often, if you have females, well, they can be very, very difficult indeed. Um, another problem is that the adults rarely attain full coloration, so you may find ones that are very, very tenoral, even though they might be a specific species which you can look at in the banding and so on. Um, and in terms of similarity to other species, can be confused with Geotomus, Ethus, and uh, Microporus. Uh, all those genera are probably intermixed and intermingled, and I believe there are some new classifications coming along at some point for some of these species. Some of them are very rare. Uh, this is one of the typical ones for uh, uh, Crete, uh, sorry, uh, Greece and Crete, which is endemic um, and not found in any other place. Uh, the other one there is, is one of mine from Corfu, which I still haven't identified yet. Another species-rich group is the Geotomus. Uh, and again, must be careful with using names. Uh, quite often, they'll be in different genera. They'll have two to three different names. And they are just basically, in terms of the melanchature, they are a bit of a nightmare. Predominantly, these species tend to be found in sandy habitats um, and are very active burrowers. So in the middle of summer, it's very difficult to find these species because they will burrow deeper in, in the dunes. Um, I say it's one of the most species-rich groups in Europe, um, and it's quite likely, given their cryptic nature, there are other species waiting to be discovered in Europe. One of the larger and more obvious species, and increasingly uh, becoming almost like pest outbreak proportions, we're talking thousands and thousands, um, there have been at least about eight to ten outbreaks in the Mediterranean in recent years of this species, which formerly is considered fairly local and, you know, it wasn't something you could readily find. Um, but um, essentially, the ecology seems to be more related not so much to sand dunes, but a little bit inland from sand dunes where you might find olive groves. Uh, sandy soils, fallow soils, where, as you can see at the bottom there, you've got poppies in red uh, growing in the middle of the olive groves. That appears to be the typical habitat for this species. And the outbreaks are because when those areas dry up, the adults are forced to move on and off the areas and quite often infest towns and villages uh, in thousands. Uh, so I say they are becoming frequently, more frequently observed now. Uh, a little wrinkle to the easy macrostatus is the fact that recently uh, new Southeast Asian species have started appearing. Uh, this is one that's been found in uh, Bath in England in a park next to a starling's nest, as you do. Um, it's much more parallel sided than Macroscytus bronius, but generally the same size. Uh, it's not really obvious from the picture, but from museum specimens, a direct comparison side by side suggests that the parallel sides of this species will distinguish it fairly readily from bronius. One of the other notes is that the uh, tibial spur, which you can see in the top photo in the hind leg of the male there, is very obvious in the males, but becomes a tiny, tiny identical in the females. So it's not usually a, a useful character unless you looking really carefully to find that identical. Males tend to be a little more easy to identify. And one of the other species within the, the other group of uh, ethos, etc., is this Microporus, which may or may not remain as Microporus. Um, there are about four or five species globally, um, but this is the only one found in Europe 
um, tends to have quite a distinctive head uh, shape and also it has a little ridge at the front of the head which has both denticles and spines which practically makes it unique amongst the uh, Sydneys in Europe. Um, it can be confused with other species superficially but tends to be a lot smaller. Uh, and this is uh, typical habitat. You might find this in numbers. I mean, I think I had about 20 or 30 from this area of the inland sand dune near Berlin. So now we come on to the Sahirine. Um, and this is where it starts to get complicated. There has been a lot of recent taxonomic changes which have confused the taxonomy of this group. So this is, if you like, the old version of Adamaris. Used to be single species in Europe, Bigotatus. Um, what you've got at the top there are three typical habitat areas in the south of England where it's basically found in sunny rides where cow wheat is growing in abundance. These are managed for a particular rare butterfly species which actually benefits this particular bug. And for those of you who don't think it's closely associated with host plant, I challenge you to look at the photo at the bottom where it sat with its head in the seed pod. So there is a fairly strict association with the various host plants within the Melampyrum group. Unfortunately, it's been a bit confused recently because the, uh, the Melampyrum used to be in the Scrofulariaceae. Um, and they were transferred to the parasitic plant group, the uh, broom rapes. No species of Adamaris are known to feed on broom rapes at the current time, probably because the broom rapes are so sporadic in their appearance and it's difficult to utilize it as a host plant. But, I mean, it's certainly something worth thinking about. Recent taxonomic changes added two new species of Adamaris. These two species were formerly in Canthophorus. Um, which are now basically Maculipes and uh, Fuscipenis. Both of these two species feed on red valerian species uh, in the Caprifoliaceae, which is a completely different family of plant to Adamaris bigotatus. Uh, so, I mean, the options there is probably these species should not have been added to Adamaris. They don't even feed on the same group of plants. A lot of the Sydneys are very, very specific on the plant families they feed on, and this is a case where they're very specific, but they should probably not be in that genus. Canthophorus strict, if you like, um, has had a recent revision by Gapon. He's basically transferred two of the species which are known from Europe into Adamaris. The remaining species that are left in Canthophorus are strictly and solely associated with Sandalaceae. So in the Mediterranean, that's actually sandalwood trees, whereas in the north of Europe, it's a single tiny, tiny plant. This basically, you can see the rabbit dropping for scale there. The plant in the middle of that photo is uh, Thesium hemifusum, or bastard toad flax, which is the sole host plant of this species, Canthophorus impressus. Uh, so you can imagine it's quite tricky to find the host plants at some point, and in some cases, even the bug. Um, but say, historically, um, even in, in Britain, we had this down as Canthophorus dubius and other species from Europe, but it was only recently it was demonstrated uh, that uh, it's actually Canthophorus impressus. They can co-occur, which leads to even further confusion. Unfortunately, Canthophorus, despite their size, need genital dissection to be clear and sure in many cases. Um, two species, Canthophorus impressus and dubious, can co-occur in um, warm grasslands in Central Europe. But interesting oddities about their behavior have yet to be unraveled. Uh, this is one example of an aggregation of uh, Canthophorus on sandalwood in Cyprus. I've seen similar aggregations in Lesvos in Greece, uh, up to two or three hundred um, at once on a single branch, which also includes nymphs. And it, it's kind of trying to work out what that behavior is for. Um, and in, we'll just throw in a doubtful species here. This one probably hasn't been recorded in Europe. Um, if it does turn up, it's quite obvious because that black elytra on Nivea marginatus is very distinctive. Related species are the Tritomagus, uh, five recognized species of Europe, which are all associated with species of Lamiaceae. Uh, only two at the top, uh, Sex maculatus and Bicolor, are at all common. 
The other three are either insanely rare or quite rare, um, depending on your definition. The middle one in the bottom of the, the slide there is rotunda penis. Um, it's got a very distinctive uh, ring, uh, entirely white ring around the, the uh, tibiae, which distinguishes it from bicolor, which has only a, a white patch on its hind tibiae. So it's worth looking for either of those species where you find one or the other to look at them carefully because they can occur on the same host plants and they can occur in the same sort of habitats. It's quite likely this is one species that's been very overlooked. The other two uh, are much rarer. Therii is essentially an Iberian species um, also found in North Africa. Um, you notice it's got very distinct, uh, well, smaller spots essentially. But then we have one other species, which is Tritomegus mycans. This is the holotype. And the question here is, should it even be in Tritomegus, given it doesn't even look remotely like the rest of these, well, essentially black and white species? It almost completely lacks any surface coloration, apart from the marginal striae, which puts it more in line of like an Adamerus or a Canthophorus. So potentially this is one species that should be potentially move to another genus. Currently known as Sony from Sicily, I don't think there are any recent records for this species. Um, these are two very old specimens, both identified by Horvath, who basically designated the type, and a sibling specimen from London. Amongst the tiniest but most fun species of shieldbug in Europe are the Acathostethus. Um, they're at 2.5 millimeters, by far the smallest species of shield bug that are present in Europe. Um, the recent revisions by Magnian have been very useful in terms of actually defining the species and even finding new species to Greece from historic specimens. Um, unfortunately, apart from uh, Odot uh, Pygmaeus, um, European species only reliably separate in the genitalia. And, and also, unfortunately, they also like to co-occur under the same host plant. This is just a, an example of a typical habitat where they can be found in uh, a, f a fallow field in Santorini. Um, and essentially, by grubbing at the base, you'll find two or three individuals. But unfortunately, at the wrong time of year, you'll only find females, which will really make it quite tricky. One minute. Okay, I'm going to have to be really quick then. So, Quercetethus, two species. Um, central species there is one from Greece, which doesn't resemble either of the two species. Could it be new? We don't know. Uh, like notice, three species. Uh, habitats quite uh, varied, but always on uh, uh, Rubiaceae. Singiria brahmapenis, known only from the holotype, only from Greece, unique to Europe. Nobody knows where it, where it does, what it eats. So Hyrus, much more complicated. Um, yeah, we have a lot of issues with this particular group and it needs a lot of work to uh, work it through. Um, none of the surface characters seem reliable as they are very, very variable. And ideally we could do with some genetic analysis in this group. A few imports, here is one from uh, all the way from New Zealand, Adresa sepultralis, which turned up in 2004. Fromundus turned up in Holland. Rhytidoporus turned up in Holland. Um, this one is a hothouse species, so almost unique amongst the European fauna. Uh, this one has colonized independently. Um, it's turned up at several uh, islands in Greece. Um, it has a massive scutellum, very distinctive in its own different family. Um, probably feeds on Boraginaceae. And this one, which has turned up at uh, light in Italy, um, which is a essentially North American species. So in conclusions, urgent stability required of higher classification. Uh, greater credit should be taken to host plant family preferences where these knowing assessing taxonomic changes because that will help to actually inform whether that is correct. Um, so Harris rarity is a very likely contributor to the lack of study in that particular genus and genetic analysis of museum specimens could help to resolve some of the outdated taxonomy. Thank you for listening. Any questions? We can take one question. Okay. Okay. Let's oh, fun. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, there's 
Sweden wanted to fight for that. Good to see you. Okay, then okay. let's take a small coffee break and return back for next next session. The, the um, phylogenetics of the group is not. But we should...